Well, we found a quail nest about three days ago that has hatched, so we celebrate that. And we know that nesting cover is important. We've talked about that in another webisode. But once the eggs hatch, then we need to think about what kind of country we need for the brood, for the little chicks. And so here we have uh, with us today Amanda Gobley. Amanda is an extension associate with Texas A&M AgriLife, working on the quail initiative. So Amanda, number one, I mean, if this nest just hatched three days ago, why aren't the chicks still in it? And then two, tell us what kind of habitat we look for if we're talking about brood habitat. Well, Dale, first of all, the chicks aren't in that nest because they are already out and about. They're on the prairie following their mom. Uh, that's because unlike songbirds, which are helpless and featherless in the nest for a long time, quail are what is referred to as precocial. So that essentially means that as soon as they hatch, they're ready to go, they're ready to follow their mother and start feeding. That seems like a pretty smart advantage if you're living on the ground and you got a lot of things trying to eat you. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of brood rearing cover, uh, brood rearing cover is important, first of all, for a few reasons. It provides our quail broods with the food that they need in order to survive and grow. So the mother, the hen, for example, needs that protein in the insects that are supported by brood rearing cover in order to produce her eggs. And the quail chicks need that protein in order to support their own growth. So for the first two weeks of their life, they'll essentially only eat insects. And our brood rearing cover is also going to be vegetation that conceals our quail from predators. So it provides some camouflage as they're out there foraging and looking for food. And then finally, brood rearing cover provides thermal refuge for our quail. So quail in general are usually very close to overheating. They have a very high metabolism and they live in a very hot environment. And for that reason, they need vegetation out there that's going to provide them with shade and moisture to lower those temperatures in the places where we find broods. Okay, we'll look at some brood habitat in just a minute. Now, again, I'm struck. I mean, here's a quail egg, smaller than a ping pong ball. Mm -hmm. That chick, when it comes out of there, weighs about a half an ounce and stands about two inches tall. So, I mean, this cover right here where the nesting is looks pretty thick. Can a, can a quail chick negotiate this kind of country or, or what do we look like to look for through the eyes of a quail and through the eyes of a quail chick as far as the structure of the country? Yeah, well, we should definitely go take a look at that. Okay. Well, we talked about the fact that, that chicks especially need insects and they've got to be able to either them or mama or daddy catch those insects for them. You know, we're talking about the the uh, smaller grasshoppers, some of the spiders, and some of those kind of things, which are fairly easy to catch, but they still have to be able to negotiate and move and travel through their habitat. And uh, if, if it's just really heavy grass, it's like a bamboo forest to them. So tell us at, at quail's eye height, what a quail's looking for in terms of brood cover. Exactly, so if we get down and look at a quail's eye view of our brood ring habitat here, we'll see that there's a very specific kind of structure that we look for in brood ring habitat. So typically, plants that fall into this category are going to be a little more broad and leafier near the top while being sparser and more open at the base. So that quail is going to be, the mama's going to be standing about that tall. Yeah, going to be about six that inches. That chick's going to be about that tall yep. again. So again, exactly. keep in mind the perspective of the critter that we're dealing with. Yep, that's exactly right. And so what that does is that these plants are then able to form a canopy that gives shade and cover to our quail, while also creating movement corridors that they can use when they're foraging for food. Amanda, we've got good plant diversity out here. What are some of the key species that we look for in terms of good brood habitat? Examples of specific plants that make good brood rearing habitat would include broomreed, for example, as well as croton, sunflowers, uh, various types of Texas wildflowers, um, kocha, things of that nature. Sunflower, I, I know that uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll see a, a mama and her, her chicks uh, in that fairly dense stands of sunflower, but again, it's dense for us and dense for a predator, but down at ground level, mm -hmm. it's very open for a quail. Yes, exactly. And also low growing shrubs like cat claw mimosa also make excellent brood rearing cover. Okay. Amanda, we've talked about the diet of the quail chicks and the fact that again, they rely upon arthropods, but over the next month, well then they're beginning to search for seeds and need seeds just like the adult quail has too. And let's talk about the importance of bare ground as far as the ability for those little chicks to find seeds like that. Is this an ideal site right here or what would you recommend uh, perhaps uh, if we need to make it better? 
Well, if you're a little bitty quail chick that's just getting started looking for food, bare ground is definitely very helpful. It's easy to scratch in, it's easy to see seeds in. So you do want a little bit of bare ground as well. Uh, not seeing a whole lot of it right around here, but I think if we navigate to another site, we'll be able to find some. Okay, but, but I guess uh, a lot of people think that, um, again, that grass, you want the thickest grass you can have, but not, and that's not necessarily the case. So some timely grazing, prescribed burning, some of those tools like that can be useful for manipulating the type of vegetation we'd like to see for brood habitat. Exactly. Amanda, we were talking about the components of good brooding habitat, and we talked about plants like sunflowers and broom weeds, those herbaceous plants, or forbs as we'd call them technically. But uh, woody plants can play a pretty important role, especially as those chicks get a little bit older. So again, talk about, uh, Talk about what we might call thermal cover, but how that relates to a bunch of uh, broody chicks. Yeah, of course. Uh, the woody cover, like what we see right behind us here, plays much the same role that those forbs do that we were talking about earlier. Provides the quail with shade and shelter, camouflage from predators, and it also gives quail hens a place to brood their chicks. Okay, so uh, we're very fortunate out here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. We have like 27 different species of woody plants, but we're right in a I typically call them quail houses, but we're in kind of a quail condo, if you will. Right now we have catclaw mimosa, we've got algerita, we've got elbow bush, we've got hackberry right here behind us. And that complex, like I said, not only provides the protective cover they need, but the shade during these days when it's 105 degrees, that, that ability to be in shade is really critically important to these critters. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're a quail with a really high body temperature, any bit of shade will help. Somebody told me that the body temperature of a quail is, is higher than a human's. What is the core body temperature of an adult bob white? It's sitting at about 108 degrees. So they're right at the brink of hyperthermia basically all the time. And, and so again, while we think of thermal cover here in the Rolling Plains largely as protection from that blue norther in February, we've got to appreciate that uh, there's a component of that, the shade of which is, is critically important. Uh, like I said, not only providing the protective cover, but also a cooler microclimate. And uh, there are some other microclimates that are important. Uh, we found around our water troughs, where the water seeps over, I've, I've noticed as much as a 40 degree differential between a bare spot out here in the sun and that little protected microclimate. So uh, there are some things that you can do to, to at least make a happier quail, uh, working on the premise that Happy cows give more milk, or we want to try to keep our quail happy too. So we try to provide them uh, plenty of opportunities, not only to be protected, but stay cool as well. Amanda, when we're talking about brood habitat, but I know that brooding is a behavior in itself. And so uh, when we say we have a broody hen or that that hen is brooding those chicks, actually, what are we talking about? Well, so when a hen broods her chicks, she's basically gathering all of them up and sort of concealing them with her feathers. And that plays a few different roles. It helps to keep them all together. It also helps to camouflage them from predators when they're all standing still. And it also helps with that thermal refuge. So by covering those chicks with her feathers, she helps to regulate their own body temperature and make sure that they're staying at the temperature they need to be. Because unlike the adult, those chicks don't have waterproof feathers at that point in their life. So they basically have to be under the umbrella of that attending female or sometimes male yeah. uh, brooding those chicks and again like I said they'll hunker down on those chicks and basically protect them from the elements. Uh, I often uh, point out about Mother's Day of, of an experience that we had in, out near Fort Stockton, Texas where we had three different blue quail hens that had hatched chicks within the last week and a flash flood comes through and we had those three hens, we found them via radio telemetry, they were under 10 inches of silt. And I think it's amazing, you know, you'd ask yourself, why would an adult bird ever drown or be covered by silt? And, and I have to tip my hat to all mothers by saying that my mother would have gone down with the ship for me. And that's an amazing display of the uh, instinctive maternal behavior that these birds uh, exhibit towards their chicks. Absolutely, they're excellent, very dedicated mothers. And fathers. And fathers. Amanda, we've talked about the importance of brood habitat and, and what some of the plants are that comprise it. We're standing in some beautiful brooding habitat as we speak. But what are some of the practices that the land manager can use if he wants to promote better brood habitat? Yeah, and if you want good brood habitat in the spring, the process is actually going to start during the colder weather months, sort of from November about through the end of March. 
And during that time, you can do some disking, some burning, get some hoof traffic out there on your land, and that'll really set the environment up nicely to get those forbs that we were talking about earlier. So basically, we're talking about, again, managing that process we call secondary succession, mm -hmm. setting it back to where it's dominated by some of the pioneer plants like this uh, sunflower right here behind us. So yeah. um, anything else that you'd like to tell students of quail, as I call them, about brood habitat and the, and the whole process of, of brooding? Well, I think I'd like to remind all students of quail that quail do require like a patchy habitat distribution. So when you want brood habitat, you want it interspersed along with the other cover types that quail need. So we want to have nesting cover in there and escape cover as well. So while we talk about the home range or the area that a covey of quail might move over during the course of their lifetime, might be 40 acres, we got to appreciate that, uh, again, like you said, a patchwork quilt design on a much smaller scale because that you know, for the first three weeks of life, those chicks may not move over five acres or kind of thing. So again, everything's got to be in close proximity, interspersion as we re refer to it. And, and that's, the, that's one piece of the puzzle for making good bob white quail habitat. Absolutely.